Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. Good morning, Dee. Good morning, Carol. Is it cold? No, not really. Oh, here it is. It's 32 degrees here. Or let me see. 33 now. Yay. 56 in paradise. Well, we're having a record cold front that came down out of uh, Denver, and it's so special. And we even have a little bit of uh, precipitation that could cause problems on the roads later. And it's October. We're supposed to be like 70. And we're at 56. And guess what I did yesterday, Dee? What did you do, Carol? I planted 855 bulbs. Oh, my word. 855. That's a lot. Let's not get excited. They were, um, all of them were the tiny bulbs where you can just basically jab a stick in the ground, make a little hole and throw it in. They, they're very easy to plant. Like crocus and Scylla siberica and stuff like that, right? China doxa. I planted f- another 500 crocuses in the lawn, another um, 100 Kyona doxa. I planted my tulipa sylvestris that we talked about. Right. The woodland tulips, they're also very small, a hundred of those. Nice. Um, the the crocuses you made me order from Old House Gardens, I got those. I had nothing to do with that, listeners. Do not let her try to lay that on me. Remember, listeners, go back to the crocus episode. She told me to get snow bunting. And once I got on the website, I got snow bunting and three others all in the ground. Well, snow bunting is particularly precious, but anyway. And we shall see. It's by my front walk, so I can see it more readily. But anyway. And it's also supposed to smell good. And that's the point of putting it close by, too, right? Uh, Yes, and I will smell it this spring. Nice. It's nice to plant bulbs because then you've got something to look forward to. Exactly. Is my attitude. Hey, guess what I did yesterday? Did you plant bulbs? No, I did not. It's not time to plant bulbs in Oklahoma yet. Oh. It will be in a couple of weeks or three weeks. Around Thanksgiving, you can plant bulbs here. No, I did not plant bulbs. I harvested honey because the weather was really good on Sunday. So I harvested honey and yesterday I strained it. And my big honey harvest for my second year of beekeeping is four small jars. But who cares? I got honey. You do, honey. honey. That's sweet. (laughs) <laughs> it is sweet. Life is sweet with honeybees. So does honey ship well? Honey does ship well, but nobody's getting these four <laughs> jars of honey. Not even you, my friend. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's move on. If I'm not getting anything out of the deal, we are moving on. Okay. So are you going to do our quote since I opened? I am. Are you ready for this? I am ready. As I looked about me, I felt that the grass was the country as the water is the sea. The red of the grass made all the great prairie the color of wine stains or of certain certain seaweeds when they are first washed up. And there was so much motion in it, the whole country seemed somehow to be running. Willa Cather. I love Willa Cather. Love her. I don't think I've read that much of her, but I know that many Mm. people are very enamored with her. Oh, well, you should read O Pioneers and My Antonia and Death Comes for the Archbishop. Those are the three classics, and they're amazing. But the reason we're talking about this one, this particular quote, is today's flower, quote unquote, is um, the inflorescences on grasses, ornamental grasses. And probably um, Willa Cather was talking about, I want to say, I, I, I have a feeling she was talking about like little blue stem in the fall when it kind of starts to turn that gold and then sometimes it turns a darker color. What do you think? Uh, I think she was talking about the prairie. I'll go as far as that. (laughs) Definitely the prairie, but maybe not. Maybe she's talking about big blue stem. I don't know. But, you know, sometimes the inflorescences of grasses right before it becomes fall, they turn that beautiful red and it does look like a wine stain. So it's kind of cool. So what do you want to talk about grasses? Do Do you grow many? Um, I have, I can count all the grasses in my gardens basically on one hand. And I don't think I, I don't think I have to use all the fingers. So I am not enamored with grasses, but I think in the right place, they are, um, 
appropriate. Okay, so here's my theory on that. I read your note where you said that the other day, and I thought, I wonder why. And here's why I think. Number one, in your climate, you get a lot of snow in winter, which will beat the grasses down, right? And I don't know that grasses um, that far north, ornamental grasses, get as beautiful as they do in Oklahoma, although you do live in paradise. Maybe, Maybe Oklahoma and Texas are a paradise for ornamental grasses because... In my garden, they're a huge, huge part of it. Well, and I I do not live, I live um, in an area that was not prairie originally. It's more um, like a transition zone between like the woodlands, the timberlands, and the prairie. It's a transition mm-hmm. zone. So I don't know. I just have not been a big fan. Well, let me see if I can help you become a, a little better fan. Okay. Yeah, but just a little. I have to tell you a funny story. So about oh okay about 10 years ago I worked with a garden designer to lay out my beds and I told her that I would be uh we needed to have like themes for the beds but then I would be planting willy-nilly regardless and right when we planted my little nano prairie she wanted to put in one of the grasses little blue stem and I says oh I don't like mm-hmm. I don't like grasses her little face fell and I said okay put in a few grasses and they they do all right Wow. Okay. I've got my work cut out. For you do. Me. So I do. I do. So here's what I'm going to say about grasses, at least where I live and why I think they're important to our landscape. And I also live in a transition zone too. I'm in part of the cross timbers section of Oklahoma, but I also, I'm like right at the edge between the prairie and the cross timbers. So I, I did a post on the blog where I talked about grasses and I've done several, but this one particularly, and I, we will link to it in our show notes because I just plugged in the link. So the wind blows a lot here. Does it blow a lot in Indianapolis? Not like Oklahoma. Okay. So the wind blows in Oklahoma, as everybody knows, it comes sweeping down the plain and it grasses sway in the wind. And not only do they have a feathery grace about them, they make a wonderful swishing sound. And then they provide cover summer through winter for pollinators and the creatures that make your garden sing, right? They also bloom in late summer and early fall often um, when the rest of the garden is starting to wind down. Think of Panicum virgatum, Virginia sweet, switchgrass. It's a great one that blooms in the fall. And then they offer elusive winter interest, at least unless you get a lot of snow. If you get a lot of snow, then they get beaten down. But in my part of the world, we don't get much snow until later. And so they really help my garden look good in the wintertime. And I think they look good every season of the year, except for early spring when you have to cut them back. But then they make room for other plants to shine until they're ready. So I love grasses. Well, and I do have some grasses, uh, like I mentioned, little blue stem, and we can, uh, the botanical name is like huge. I hate it. Uh, yeah, it is huge. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not even going to attempt it. Little blue stem is, doesn't have many other botanical names, but I, the designer described it as uh, sort of the matrix and the forbs are the flowers. So if you have like a little natural planting area like I do, little blue stem is mm-hmm. kind of like interwoven amongst all the other flowers and just kind of, uh, for lack of a better way, I would say softens the whole garden. Yes, it does. And um, so yeah. it's it's attractive, and um, but I wouldn't say that I'm enamored with it still. And it's attractive when it's in bloom. But because I'm planting all those bulbs, you know, I'm going to cut them back this fall. So there will be no winter interest from them. You're cutting them back this fall? Yeah. Oh, I don't cut mine back in the fall. I went into the spring. Well, those, because they're in a perennial bed where I want to plant a bunch of bulbs. So they're going to... Ah, got it. But the other grasses I have, which we're going to talk about, like the the switchgrass, that's kind of uh, Mm -hmm. in front in an area that's... uh, supposed to hide the utility box that stay right that stays until about february and there'll be a nice day in february and then like you said it'll be kind of beat down from snow and everything and i'll go and i'll cut it down then but i leave it all all winter oh okay so you want to talk uh, i'll talk a little bit about the grasses that i grow okay there's a few all right wait do we have time for all of them dear do you want to just do your like top five 
<laughs> I'll do I'll do my top five. How about okay. that? Okay. Okay, so my top five, number one on my top five hit chart is Pink Muley Grass. And you've got to admit my pictures of Pink Muley Grass in September are knocked down dead gorgeous, right? They are knocked down dead gorgeous. Dear Indiana listeners, Pink Muley Grass is not hardy in our area. So you may look, yeah. You may look, but do not plant. Yeah, don't plant pink muley grass up there. It is definitely hardy where I live. A lot of people think it isn't, but it is. And there's a couple of different varieties that are pretty popular. Um, pink muley grass is Muhlenbergia capillaris, and Regal Mist is one variety. That's the trade name. And then there's also a variety called Fast Forward. And Fast Forward is supposed to bloom two weeks earlier. I grow both of them. They bloom at the same time. So I, I've not seen that. And I'll be honest, so far... Regal Mist has done better in my garden than Fast Forward. Then there's the switch grasses, and I own, I grow a bunch of them. There's Panicum Virgatum. It's native to Virginia, hence the name Virgatum. So Cloud Nine I do not grow because it is too big even for my garden, and it's because it's nine feet tall. But they grow it at Oklahoma State University, and I've got some pictures from there. I grow North Wind, but it's really hard to find the actual North Wind. Um, grasses, Panicums like to mix. And so even distributors are having a little bit of trouble. But mine, I think, is a legitimate north wind because I've had it a long time. Once something becomes popular sometimes, it, it gets hard to find the actual plant. Um, then there's Dallas Blues. It's a very pl- pretty blue foliage. And Proven Winters has one called Cheyenne Skies. These are both shorter. So north wind grows six feet tall. Um, the other two grow quite a bit shorter. And D? So those are my what? two favorites. D, I have switchgrass. Mm-hmm. I have Shenandoah. You do? Yeah. I like Shenandoah, too. It's beautiful. And Shenandoah only gets maybe three, three and a half feet tall. Just enough to cover that utility yeah, it, box. Right. It's not that big. Okay, moving on, there's ruby grass, which is absolutely beautiful. It is not always hardy, even in my climate. And no, I am not going to try to do the botanical name too hard. Um, It is very, very pretty, though. It has nice pink um, plumes at the top of it. And it's a little tiny grass. I'm holding my hand so Carol can see. Um, About a foot and a half tall. Not very big. But D? Also small. Yes. D, I want to try the botanical name on that. Oh, go for it. Ruby grass. Melinas (laughs) Melinas <laughs> Nerviglumus. That's probably close. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, okay, hey, and so you got uh, you got to stop and pause. Melinas Nerviglumus. I think it's an easy name. I'm going to make you do Okay, well, we're going to make you do a uh, little blue stem since you did that. Late. All right, so then <laughs> keep going. So Ruby Ruby grass does not overwinter in my garden every year. It just depends on how wet the winter is. It really, really likes dry weather. Same thing holds true with Mexican feather grass. And Mexican feather grass, which is Nacella tunisima, which is synonym is stipa or stipa tunisima. It is a beautiful feathery grass. It usually overwinters if it's not too wet here. Um, it has become invasive in some parts of the United States. Can you grow it? I don't think we can grow Mexican feather grass. Uh, I think it's zone six, but and don't and some it. of these grasses, they will sell as an annual um, in the spring mm-hmm. to put in like containers and things as sort of a you know filler type thing. So it may show up as a right. filler. Okay, so here I put it in the front of my beds and let it wave. And actually, Monty Don put it in one of his gardens this year um, on Gardener's World. He put it on there, and then he put drumstick alliums with it. It was very pretty. I can't remember the name of that little garden he did, but if you go back and look at the old episodes, you'll see it. And then I guess we're at number five or number six, and it's blue grandma grass. And blue grandma grass is a favorite here, too. It can grow in pure gravel. It's hot, hot, hot. Um, It's... Uh, I'm going to try it. Budaloa gracilis. Blonde Ambition is the variety you want because it has chartreuse blooms and it's, it needs almost no water at all. And it was discovered by David Salmon of High Country Gardens. And D. And it's been, it's very popular. Yes, Karen. I have that one. The Blue Grandma. You do? Yes. They sent me some trial plants um, last year. And so they're growing and yeah. um, 
they're doing all right, but they were very small plants, so it's taken them a little while to catch hold. But I put those with my um, uh, switchgrass, Shenandoah. I put those with that in that area because the Shenandoah was starting to die out a little bit. Mm-hmm. And why was it starting to die out? Because it's getting some shade. Ah, uh, no. Grasses do not like shade. They want full sun, except for one that you're going to talk about. Right. It can do some shade. But that's pretty much it for me, except for, I was going to say, we need to say that uh, Blonde Ambition isn't very tall. It's about two and a half feet, maybe, in height, and it is a very slow grower. I've had my two clumps for years, and although it comes up every year and blooms every year and looks really good, it's just very slow. Well, I, I was going to say the the uh, switchgrass, a little bit of it's getting the shade, and I added the blonde ambition where actually because it's I mentioned this by a utility box so one day a couple of years ago in February I looked out and there were flags all over the yard marking all the utility lines and right <clears throat> a certain company whose initials are AT&T <laughs> came in and put in fiber optics in the neighborhood and so they had to dig around the utility box and right. they dug out a lot of the switchgrass. And so rather than just stick it all back in, I put in some of that blonde ambition. It'll look nice. It will. It'll look very nice. And also, we didn't talk about maiden grass, but maiden grass particularly has a problem. Even though I like it very much, it is also invasive in a few places, but not very much is invasive in Oklahoma. It's too hard to grow things here anyway. Maiden grass, which is Miscanthus sinensis, and my favorite one is Adagio because it has that white stripe down the blades. Um, so it looks silvery, you know, in the light. It has this habit, which some grasses do, they die in the middle. They form the donut. The big donut, the big donut of death. That's what they do. So in the middle of the grass, it'll just keep growing outward, 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 because there's not very many nutrients in the middle part of the grass. So the middle part dies out, and the rest of it just keeps kind of spreading to the outside. And when that happens, what do you do, Carol? Dig and divide. Either dig and divide or scoop out that middle part and let try to and put some um, nutrients back in the soil. I mean, there's various ways to do it. I will say this, miscanthus gets really big and it is kind of hard to dig out. It is very, and that's, we should say that about all the grasses. And I don't know if this is true or not, but my feeling is the grasses have deep, sturdy roots. And you think about, you know, growing them in the prairie and um, they are very hard to dig out once you get them. And so, yeah, I used to have Japanese blood grass, which I don't have anymore. I have some, but that took a while yeah, to dig out. That took a while. I bet it did. And then yeah. the other grass that I have is Japanese forest grass, which... I have it too. Which for, Go ahead and say what it is. It's uh, Hakanakloa macra. <laughs> and the reason people grow it is it actually does tolerate shade. But my experience and the experience of other people I know is it takes a long while for it to take, so to speak, and start spreading like you yeah. want it to. Mine doesn't spread at all. Mine stays one little tiny clump next to a rock. And I have Aria, and I also have the All Gold. And both of them are kind of miserable here. It's too hot. They're, mine is spread out just a tiny bit, and I'm still hopeful as that area becomes more and more shady. But right, oftentimes the shade means that there's tree roots, and it can be very dry shade. And so I just think sometimes you've got to give it a lot of extra care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just isn't very happy here. I've seen it um, on the Pacific Coast and up by Seattle, and I've seen huge, huge clumps of it, and that kind of made me depressed. And so I just kind of ignore it. Yeah, I chop it back in the spring, and I pretend it's not there because it's kind of an embarrassment in my garden. Yeah, it's a little bit of embarrassment in most people's garden, truth be told. <laughs> You know, you want to grow things, and then when you travel around the United States, you see what hostas look like in Chicago or what Japanese forest grass looks like in a climate that's similar to Japan, and you go, oh, well, that's depressing, and then you try not to think about True. it. True. So that's probably enough about grasses. I don't think I'm convinced to run out and buy more grasses, which is probably good for my pocketbook. Probably. But I appreciate that they make a big statement in some places in your garden. 
They do. So most of the pictures this week on Instagram of grasses will be mine. Yeah, because Carol doesn't have very many. (laughs) I'll see what I can come up with. Yeah, but I don't have very many of our veggie slash fruit that we're doing this week. Yeah. So those will be yours. So do you want to do the quote or you want me to? Uh, I think you should do it. I found it. I should do it. Picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket. Picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket. Picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket. Way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. I think you should have sung it. No. (laughs) Dee, remember a couple weeks ago I said I was going to do my singing debut? Oh, yeah. I forgot all about that. Well, in a couple of weeks I'll be ready. Okay, whatever you say. All right, so everybody, we're talking today about native fruit trees in our veggie section, and particularly we're talking about persimmons and pawpaws. So pawpaws, I don't grow pawpaws. I don't have a persimmon tree either, although I'm thinking about getting one. The pawpaw, I'm not so sure. Well, I do grow pawpaws. Convince me, Carol. Okay, I looked at the the pawpaw is a native tree. I looked at its range, right, and it is barely native into uh, eastern Oklahoma along the fringe. So it needs water. So it probably won't cross the state line, but it does. Um, it's a. I don't want to say it's a smaller tree, but it's not like a great big oak. It's an understory tree, and it's or a persimmon. Right, <laughs> persimmons are they're huge, huge. and uh, native ones. Yeah, uh, they are grow forming. Plants, which is why they talk about way down yonder in the pawpaw patch, because usually there's more than one in a location. They have a delicious fruit. I am told it's delicious. And even though I have two pawpaws, (laughs) and you need two for (laughs) cross-pollination, just like apples. Right. Every time the pawpaw... What happened to your pawpaws? My pawpaws got eaten by raccoons. I hate raccoons. And Let's just say it loud, say it proud. They're cute. They have little hands. Cute little bandit faces, but they are definitely bandits. Yes, and I think I've had the pawpaws for about four years. Um, I oh. The first two years, they didn't have any fruit. Then when they had fruit, the first year, there was just like two, and they got stolen. Last This spring, or this fall, there were six, and they got stolen while I was in Utah with you at the Garden, oh. at garden Com. I came home, and they were gone. But... <laughs> Uh, I'm told they sort of taste like a banana, which is the common name is like Indiana banana or Ohio banana or Kentucky banana or Michigan banana, whatever state, add the word banana. And that's the common name. Interesting. I didn't know any of this. But it's uh, it's worth I think they're worth growing in a property as a smaller native tree. Um, got to keep the raccoons out of them. And the raccoons also broke off like two big branches in the one tree and they're not that big yet. So. Hmm. Interesting. But get, get two. Uh, so they cross pollinate and get them from a place like Stark brothers that sells grafted trees. If you go out to Mm -hmm. the woods and even with permission, try to dig them, they are notoriously difficult to transplant. Right, because they're a grove tree. Yeah. So that's my advice on pawpaws. Definitely try them. Besides, you you should never go out and try to dig up things and then grow them in your garden. Unless an area is being destroyed by advancing machinery. You, then you can dig something up if you want to. But pretty much with native things, you should just leave them there. Correct. So let's move on to our next native fruit tree, persimmons. I don't have a persimmon tree. I know where there is a persimmon tree not far from here. I do, too. I do, too. I don't really care for persimmons. Okay, that's not fair because you've only had them one way. Well. I think you can bake them into like a bread, like a fruit bread, and I've heard they're really good. Yes. Um, But the persimmon is, uh, it's an interesting tree. It is very interesting. I did a whole article on it for HGTV once. So are you getting one? I have not gotten one. Um, In that article, I talked about both the American persimmon and also the Asian persimmon. You can buy more of the Asian persimmon than you can the American one, but you can find the American one. Um, I don't know. I mean, you need need to buy it from a nursery. They're kind of a complicated tree, and the American one gets huge. Yeah, it's a great big tree. The one I saw 
well, the one I see every year, this time of year, is in a park that I walk at called Mitch Park. And that tree is 60 feet tall if, you know, if it's tall at all. It's one of the biggest persimmon trees I've ever seen. And I only notice it when it's in the fall because, you know, the persimmons stay on the tree. Like, like today we're having a freeze. Tonight we're going to have a big freeze. And so that's when you want to pick the persimmons is my understanding. So it, there, the leaves fall off that tree and you just see it. It's just full of persimmons. Right. And my understanding too and we'll link to your article so that people can read the actual facts as we speculate about trees we don't grow. <laughs> Most people, you have to wait until there's been a good hard frost and then the fruit falls to the ground and you actually pick it up off the ground. Right. But they're very nutritious fruit. That's one reason people eat Yeah, them. and I think the native persimmons, uh, once they're in season, there's a very short season and then people have sources where they get them. The same with pawpaws. Pawpaws are no, notorious mm-hmm. for not being able to be stored. And I wrote an article about pawpaw trees for Indiana Gardening several years ago. And back in the early 1900s, they actually tried to make the pawpaw more of a commercial crop. But you just you huh. can't store them very well. They keep in the refrigerator for a week or two. Um, you can scoop out the pulp and freeze it. But then... it. But right. so they didn't make a go of this commercial enterprise. Yeah, I think it, I think it would be pretty pretty hard. But it would be cool to grow a pawpaw. Most people grow the Asian persimmon. For one thing, it's a smaller tree, and um, they're I'm told that they're a little easier to grow. But that's all I know about persimmons, really, other than what I wrote in the article a few years ago. I, if you want to, tra- if any of our listeners grow persimmons or use fruit from the persimmon tree that they walk past at the uh, park. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, it would be interesting. And I know this, uh, where the persimmon tree is not, it's just like half a mile from here. It's in a a nursery Um, and they'll pick them up off the ground. It's a native tree. That's really cool. I, I would, I mean, I've tried persimmons from an Asian tree that I bought at the Asian supermarket and I wasn't really impressed, but I think I just don't know how to do it. That's right. I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. All right. Back onto our dirt. I guess we're going to talk about the scary holiday that's coming up on Thursday. Halloween. So best costumes for gardeners. Well, I came up with several. Of course, you could dress as the Jolly Green Giant. You could. Scarecrow. Of course. Classic choice. Uh, I would not dress as a garden fairy. That's just weird. Why would that be that weird? A little kid? A little kid as a garden fairy? Oh, a little kid. I was thinking about an adult. But a little kid would be cute. When I was a kid, you know, Halloween was more for kids. And so I always think that. But anyway, um, so I think about the kids and we used to go trick-or-treating. And gosh, if a little honeybee came up to my door, they'd get all the candy. Yeah, the little honeybees with little daisy faces or ladybugs. Any kid that comes up to the door and is dressed like something from the garden, I just empty the candy bowl right in their bag. Absolutely. They get all the candy. No scary masks, though. I don't like scary stuff. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it's going to be miserable in Indiana for Halloween night. I Here, hear. too. Like like 27 degrees. Eek. Re- Horrible. I feel bad for the kids, but I don't get a lot of trick or treaters. They go to more to events now these days. I think. I think they do too. That churches hold events. Lots of places hold events. The mall holds an event here, and people go yeah. to that. So we don't get well. And that where I live, you don't get any trick or treaters at all. Sadly, but that's okay. That's true. And D, have you ever been tempted to give them like a tulip bulb instead of uh, candy? No, I have not. Have you? Okay, so I I move on to protect myself. Um, oh no! <laughs> did you? So I don't think kids want tulip bulbs. I don't think they do either. I actually, my policy, and I'll get like a dozen kids at most. My policy is have a big candy bar, lots of candy, so that I'm known as the lady that they gave them a ton of candy. Exactly. They won't egg your house that way when they're older. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> With security cameras and things okay, like that, so, no way. 
So last night, I think it was last night on CBS, they had the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, which is a classic. Love that show. You can watch it on YouTube anytime you want to, but you have a different story that you wish we would do instead of the great pumpkin. Well, are you familiar with the Halloween hair? I am because I read your blog. So on, on Halloween night, the Halloween hare visits all the gardens of the gardeners. And if he doesn't like how the garden's been maintained, he makes a big mess. And he also looks for candy. And if he doesn't find candy, like sitting in the grass for him to eat, he makes a big mess. Yeah. He'll make a big mess. When you say big mess, what do you mean? He tears up plants or he poops? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> He turns over containers and things like that. Oh, okay. I got you. So he's a little bit like a gremlin or a goblin. Yes. And bad hair. The whole point of the Halloween hair is if he doesn't like your garden and he makes a mess by turning over mm -hmm. containers and things like that, then on Christmas, when the Christmas cottontail comes with Santa, the Christmas yeah. cottontail doesn't like messy gardens. Or ones that haven't been maintained. And the Christmas cottontail will stay in Santa's sleigh and won't come plant bulbs and seeds for spring flowers. Oh, my goodness. So it's really important on Halloween night that your garden look good. Your garden needs to look good on Halloween night, according to the Halloween hair story, which you wrote. And then on top of it, you've got to make sure you have candy for the little creature. Yeah. What kind of candy does a Halloween hare like? Well, the Halloween hare is especially fond of leftover Easter candy that wasn't found in the big egg hunt. But I figured. But if you don't have leftover candy from the egg hunt, you can just throw out some um, Halloween candy, and it'll take that. You know, maybe the Halloween hare is just misunderstood, and so he's just looking for that leftover Easter candy, and he accidentally makes a mess of your garden. No, because if your garden's in a pretty good shape, the Halloween hair won't mess with it. Oh, okay, well, I'm in deep trouble. That's all I got to say. Mine is not in good shape. See, I made up the story. I get to make the rules for the Halloween hair. Oh, okay. I just thought maybe it was misunderstood like all villains are these days. Yes, all of them are misunderstood. <laughs> but anyway, um, I hope your Halloween is very nice. I hope yours is too. And I hope all our listeners have a happy Halloween also. And maybe they'll meet the Halloween hare or the great pumpkin. Maybe. Maybe. Anyway, you can find us at thegardenangelus at gmail.com. We are also the Garden Angelus on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And then individually, we are under various names on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I think, I don't know if she's on Pinterest, but I'm on Pinterest. But anyway, most of mine are Red Dirt Ramblings. Some of hers are Indie Gardener, and some of them are May Dreams. And I think that's it. It was great chatting over the garden gate. It's a little chilly today, but I enjoyed our chat. I enjoyed our chat, too. Okay, see you then. Bye. Bye. <laughs>